Welcome. In this session, I'm going to talk about some of the interesting features of the x86 architecture and some of the interesting bits and pieces that can be found in some of the Intel and AMD processors. And they're going to be all over the place, but it's just to give you a little bit of an illustration of the kind of things that we need to look at and understand so that we can decide whether we're going to use any of this in VMS or not, or whether it's something that we need to think about or work around in some fashion in the operating system. I think you've all, you all know me, so I'm going to skip this one slide. So on the agenda, I'm going to go into the architecture-specific documentation. I'm going to talk a little bit about memory segmentation, which is something weird and unique to the x86 architecture that our previous architectures didn't have. I'm going to talk about processor modes, I'm going to talk about firmware and early boot initialization, and I'm going to take a look at a brand new instruction set extension called TSX. When you're writing or porting an operating system, you need to know a lot about the underlying platform, so you need documentation to learn about these platforms. So for the VAX, what you needed was the VAX11 architecture reference manual. For Alpha, you needed the Alpha reference manual. For Itanium, you need the Intel Itanium architecture software developers manual. And for x86, you need the Intel 64 and IA32 architecture software developers manual, <laughs> which is a mouthful. So just to give you a bit of an impression, this is what it looks like. This is an empty shelf in my bookcase at home and I'm going to add the VAX documentation. That's one inch of documentation. Now I'll add the alpha documentation. That's about two inches. Let's add the Itanium documentation. That's five inches. Now I'm going to add the x86 documentation. That's 12 inches of documentation that you sort of need to go through to understand this architecture to the level of detail that you need to know before you can write an operating system. The first interesting feature we're going to explore is memory segmentation. And this is something that really originated with the very earliest 8086 and 8088 processors. Those were 16-bit processors, but Intel didn't want to be restricted to 64 kilobytes of main memory. They wanted to be able to address a megabyte of main memory, so these chips have a 20-bit address space. And the way they did it using 16-bit registers is that there are two 16-bit registers involved in any memory addressing. So you've got your segment register, which is a 16-bit register, and then you've got whatever register you use for your address, or a 16-bit immediate address, which is also a 16-bit quantity. So the segment register basically selects which 64 kilobyte part of the one megabyte address space you're going to look at. And this can be located on any 16-byte boundary because what happens is this segment register gets shifted left by four bits and then it's added to the address that you're using to result in the effective address. So this is how you how that would work uh, in a small picture. By the way, if throughout any of this there are any questions, just interrupt me, raise a hand, shout at me. I'd rather answer questions when we're on the slide, the question is about then at the end of the session. There are separate segment registers on the 8086 chip for code, data, and stack. And then there's an extra segment uh, register. So normally, every different use, so if you're going to the stack or if you're executing an instruction, the segment and register that's used for that operation is predefined. And for everything but the code segment, that can be overridden with instruction prefixes. The 
ES segment, the extra segment, if you want to use that, you'd put a prefix in front of your instruction that basically tells the processor, for any addresses we're going to use where you would normally use the data segment, I now want you to use the extra segment. So that's one way to get to use the extra segment. The other way is if you're using string manipulation instructions, those normally have the source relative to the data segment and they use the extra segment for the destination address. While this may seem overly complicated, for its time it was a fairly elegant, simple way to be able to address the entire one megabyte memory space. Of course time did not stand still and pretty soon one megabyte of main memory was not enough. So enters the 32-bit 386 with its protected mode. So when a 386 system boots, it's behaving like an 8086 with 20-bit address space. Once you put it into protected mode, you can use the entire 32-bit address space. But they decided to retain those segment registers, except that now they're no longer containing the upper part of the address, rather they are now what Intel calls segment selectors. They also added two more segment selectors, FS and GS, which are basically to be used by the programmer in any way they see fit. And this selector, as I said, is no longer the upper part of the address. It is now an index into one of two tables of segment descriptors. A segment descriptor defines the starting point of the segment and it defines the limit or the length of the segment. It also defines the protection bits, so it tells the processor whether you can access this segment in user mode or if it's restricted to supervisor mode and whether you can write to it or not. The limit that is stored in the segment descriptor is a 20-bit entity and that is either in bytes. So if you use byte granularity, then a segment can be up to one megabyte in size, or it is in four kilobyte pages. So if you use that page granularity, then a segment can cover the entire virtual address space of four gigabytes. And to complicate matters slightly further, the segmentation mechanism operates on top of paging if you use paging. To put it into a picture, I've got the GDTR, which is a register that points to the global descriptor table. And the global descriptor table is a structure in memory that contains descriptors. And I have my DS segment selector. The value I put in DS now becomes an index into the GDT. So it points at a specific descriptor and the descriptor tells the processor where the segment begins and where it ends. If I'm using address zero in the DS segment and the DS segment selector points at a descriptor that tells the processor that the DS segment starts at address one megabyte, my pointer that contains the value zero points to one megabyte in the virtual address space. So here you've got your virtual memory and then you've got your paging, so it basically could be anywhere in physical memory. Now we get 64-bit processors and they introduce long mode, which is the 64-bit mode. So long mode is very similar to the 386 protected mode, except that for CS, DS, ES and SS, four out of six segment selectors. The base and limit that are put into the segment descriptor are effectively ignored. If you address virtual memory through one of these four segment selectors, your pointer value is always the actual address in virtual memory. For these four segments, there is basically no segmentation anymore you're always looking at the entire virtual address space. 
However, for the FS and GS segment selectors, that still works pretty much the way segmentation worked on the 386. So if you access address zero through FS or GS, where you end up in real virtual memory depends on the um, base address that would put into the segment descriptor that FS or GS points at. If you go through any of the other selectors, address zero is always address zero in your virtual memory space. The protection bits are still used, yes. What you would see in an operating system is that you have a code descriptor for kernel mode in your GDTR. You would have a code descriptor for non-kernel mode or user mode. You would have a data descriptor for kernel mode and a data descriptor for user mode. So you'd have four segment descriptors that you go through and you basically switch where you go from user to kernel mode and vice versa. How are we going to use segmentation in OpenVMS? Do we need to do anything with it? Don't we? We first thought we could probably ignore this altogether because it's this, this strange remnant from days past. However, it turns out there's a pretty good use case for it. And that is because on x86, it turns out to be surprisingly difficult to find out what CPU I am currently running on. Every other CPU architecture has an internal processor number a reg register that has a number in it that is unique to a processor in a system. x86 doesn't have that. If I want to find out what processor I'm on, I pretty much have to go to ACPI or to the Advanced Programmable Interrupt Controller to get a number from it. And that means you're going to basically do an I.O. operation to figure out what processor I am, which is fairly expensive. Plus, the number you get is not a nice contiguous sequence. So if you have six processors in a box, you may get numbers 0, 1, 2, 4, 5, and 6 and it may skip number three. And we'd like to have a nice contiguous number. What we're going to do in OpenVMS, we're going to use the GS segment to point to a CPU specific data structure. To be precisely, it's going to point at the Swiss data structure. And there we can put information that is specific to the CPU that the operating system needs to be able to access at all time. So the way this is going to work in short is the GDT, the global descriptor table, is going to different for each processor. And for each processor, the GS, the descriptor for the GS segment will point at a different portion of the virtual address space. So that way we have some CPU specific information in memory that we can find through something the processor often offers which is a very fast mechanism. The FS segment register, we're going to use that for storage that is local to a thread rather than a process. If you've got a process with multiple threads in it, you need a mechanism to find data that is specific to the thread that you're using. Think of things like the thread control block or thread local storage. So we're going to use a mechanism that's going to be based on the FS segment to get to that information. I'm now going to talk about processor modes. What I use by these are not the, pro uh, the protection modes like kernel, executive, supervisor, user. Intel calls those rings in their architecture. When Intel talks about modes, they mean how does this processor behave? Does it behave like a 16-bit 8086, or is it going to behave like a 32-bit 386, or like a 64-bit um, machine? So even though we're only interested in the 64-bit processors, it is important to note that all the modes that were ever present in Intel processors are still there. These processors are pretty much fully backward compatible 
when you first bring them up and you apply power to the power pins on the processor, the processor is going to act like it's an 8086 processor. If you look at the big picture, when there was an 8086, it always ran in something which Intel calls real mode, which is that one megabyte address space using the segment registers. So the 286 first added protected mode, which was a 16-bit implementation of protected mode. And then the 386 added 32-bit protected mode. And they also found that there were people who were running in protected mode who would like to run applications that were written for the 8086 in real mode. And on the 286, you couldn't do that. So on the 386, they added something called virtual 8086 mode, which basically allows a program that was written for the 8086 and that expects to see a flat one megabyte address space to run under an operating system that runs in 32-bit protected mode. Since the introduction of the 64-bit systems, these modes together are now known as part of legacy mode. And there's a new mode which is called long mode. Now, long mode, you can be in long mode and still run 32-bit code. That is called compatibility mode. And then, so when you get into long mode, you can then switch into 64-bit mode. So 64-bit mode is a subset of long mode to keep it simple. And then basically outside all of this, you have something called system management node. It's something that we don't, we, we would like to concern ourselves with it because there's interesting things happening there, but we really can't because this is completely under the control of firmware and an operating system pretty much has no say in this. So a lot of the code that's related to ACPI actually executes in this system management mode. And the code that executes there is provided partly by Intel, partly by the platform builder. In VMS, what we're really interested in is this 64-bit mode. And we've always said anything that runs on VMS is always going to run in 64-bit long mode. No exceptions. So you'd guess we can forget completely about all the other modes, right? Can we? To answer that question, we need to take a good look at what happens very early in the boot process. I mean early. I mean starting from where the firmware initializes the system. So if you look at firmware initialization, the moment you turn the power switch on your machine on, your machine is under control of the UEFI firmware. When the UEFI firmware is initialized and we run the OS loader or the boot manager, it runs on only one processor, the primary CPU. Now, UEFI uses different names for everything. So UF, in, if you read the UEF, UEFI documentation, you won't find the term primary processor. What you will find instead is the term BSP, bootstrap processor. Secondary CPUs, another term you won't find, those are called APs, application processors. When our boot manager starts, the UEFI firmware has put the bootstrap processor into 64-bit long mode, which is great. The bootstrap processor is exactly where we need it to be to run open VMS. However, if you look at the secondary CPUs or the application processors, what happens there is that the UEFI firmware initializes them. As part of the initializes, it probably puts them into 64-bit long mode. It probes the processor capabilities puts that into its view of the world so that it can tell the operating system how many CPUs there are, what their capabilities are, what their ID numbers are, things like that. And then it basically shuts those processors down. And those processors from there on behave like they have never been turned on in the first place. 
when we as the operating system now want to do anything with these application processors, we need to go through a process to wake these processors up. And when they wake up, guess where they are? <coughs> They're down in the bottom left corner where it says 8086 real mode. We wake them up by sending each processor an init IPI, <coughs> initialize, which is the first part of waking up a processor. The second part is we send them something called a SIPI, a startup IPI. An IPI is an interprocessor interrupt. Even though these processors are asleep and or pretty much dead, they won't respond to anything but to the combination of first getting an init interprocessor interrupt followed by a startup interprocessor interrupt. In the startup interprocessor interrupt, there's eight bits of data that you can send as part of the interrupt. And that specifies the address at which that secondary processor will start executing code. Sometimes the wake up didn't work. We found that out the hard way. <laughs> if the processor doesn't respond to the startup interrupt, you basically give it a few milliseconds and if you then don't see it initialize itself and start running some code, you have to send the startup in or, or the combination of the init interrupt and the startup interrupt again and hope it responds this time. When the AP starts, when the secondary processor starts, it starts up in 20-bit real address mode and we have to switch it into protected mode, then into long mode and finally into the 64-bit mode. We start out here in real mode. From there we have to go into protected mode. From there we have to go through compatibility mode and finally into the 64-bit long mode where we want to be. This all happens very early on in sysboot. No, it happens in the boot manager, sorry. I'm getting confused now. This happens in the boot manager and what we do there basically is we then let the processor wait on a synchronization and then it's sysboot that finally tells these processors it's okay you can start continuing to execute code now at this point. So we initialize it in the boot manager so we are sure that by the time we tell sysboot what they can find in the system that these processors are actually there and that we did manage to wake them up so they're ready to go. Any questions about any of this? All right. I'll keep going then. The last thing I want to look at is something that I find very interesting and it's an extension to the instruction set that Intel has added to their processors very recently. They actually added it twice. <laughs> they first added it in some of the Haswell processors and everyone was really excited and thinking we can make good use of this and then a bug was discovered in the implementation. Intel tried to figure out, is this something that we can solve with a microcode update? And it turned out they couldn't. They had to change the silicon of the processor to fix the bug. What they did instead is they did issue a microcode update, but what the microcode update did was disable the feature so no one would end up using something that was flawed. It came in Haswell and then it went away again. And we had to wait until Skylake to get it again. And in Skylake, they managed to fix it in the silicon. And now this appears to be working quite nicely. Now, of course, you want to know what it's about. So this is all about solving a problem that we have with locks. And one of the most difficult things to get right in a multi-threaded application or in an operating system is the synchronization between threads that may run simultaneously on different processors. And the reason it's difficult is because you want to do this without having too much of a performance impact. 
The problem is that if you have multiple threads running at the same time on different processors, they may try to access the same memory structure at the same time. So this can lead to problems where one process is in the middle of writing some data structure, where another pro um, or one thread and another thread at the same time is reading from this data structure. And it may get part of the data that is the data that was in the structure before the other processor started writing to it and part of it may be from what was just written to it. So you're getting an inconsistent state that you're reading there. It gets even worse if multiple processes are writing to the data at the same time because those writes may be in a different order and you may end up getting part of the data that was written by this thread and part of the data that was written by another thread and now you've got something in memory that isn't consistent. The most commonly used mechanism to overcome this is to use some form of locking. Mutexes, spin locks, things like that. Locking is expensive and because you need to acquire the lock, you need to release the lock, which are all memory operations. And everything that needs to go to memory is more, in, more expensive than anything you can do inside the processor's registers. So there's always a trade-off between simplicity, where you have coarse locking, where you basically have a data structure and you look all of, lock all of it at the same time, and no matter how long a processor takes, doing whatever it needs to the structure, you just keep it locked all that time, which means another thread might wait on the lock for a long time. On the other hand, you can go for maximum performance, in which case you often want to do very fine-grained locking, which can become very complicated. Because what happens if I want to lock data structure A followed by a lock on data structure B, while I'm keeping the lock on data structure A while I manipulate data structure B. And I have another thread that also wants those two locks, but it wants them in the opposite order. You can end up in a deadlock where process A cannot continue because process B is holding the lock on data structure B and processor B can't continue because it needs lock A and it's held by process A. To get this absolutely right while having high performance is one of the most difficult things to get right. I think most people can probably agree with me um, who have worked on operating systems. Intel has, well, Intel by its own hasn't done this. This is based on a lot of scientific research that has gone into this area. But Intel has come up with an implementation of some ideas to eliminate a lot of locking or eliminate the need for a lot of locking. What they're doing is they're basically exploiting the local data cache that resides on every CPU. The idea is we're going to have transactions, which are something that we know of from databases where you have a transaction and either the entire transaction happens or none of it happens. During one of these transactions, what will happen is that any write that happens to memory never makes it to memory during the transaction. In fact, the other processors on the system don't see it. Normally, even though a memory write hasn't gone out to main memory yet, while it is in the processor's cache, the other CPUs will be instantly aware of it because there is a cache coherency bus that connects the processors together. These transactions don't go out on the cache coherency bus. So what happens is during this transaction, all of these memory writes sort of build up in the local CPU cache. And at the end of the transaction, when you mark the end of it, the processor knows exactly what it needs to send to main memory and what it needs to send out on the cache coherency bus to update memory and to update the other CPU's view of memory. And this all basically happens at once. This happens atomically.
Of course, in real life, it takes a little time, but the way this protocol works is the other processors will see it immediately because they are watching this cache coherency bus. What does happen, even though the writes themselves do not go out on this cache coherency bus, is the CPU does signal its intent to write to this memory address on the cache coherency bus. And a processor that is inside one of these transactions will monitor that cache coherency bus for intended writes and actual writes that hit the same memory that it is using in its transactions. If inside my transaction I'm reading from memory or I'm writing to memory and the processor sees that another processor is also writing to that memory or writing to that memory as part of its own transaction, we detect a conflict. And what the processor does at that point is it basically says conflict, throw away whatever we did in this transaction. So your entire transaction from that point on never sees the light of day. What happens after that, after the, the transaction abort, is something that depends on how you use this extension. I'll go into that next, but I just want to make sure that everyone understands the mechanism so far. Any questions? Jamie. Yeah, so what you need to remember is that the CPU cache is very tightly integrated into the CPU core. The CPU, while it is doing this transaction, is keeping track of which cache lines in its local cache are part of the transaction that then need to be flushed out to main memory after the transaction is done. There are two mechanisms that Intel has implemented to make use of this underlying principle of, of using the cache. The first and simplest you can use is something called HLE, Hardware Lock Elision. HLE is part of the TSX instruction set extension. It's an interface, so to speak. When you're using HLE, you basically write your code exactly as you would if you were using locking but you prefix the instruction that you use to acquire the lock with a special instruction prefix x acquire and the instruction that you use to release the lock at the end of your transaction you prefix that with a x release prefix these prefixes are new but older processors will see the prefix and simply ignore this so the big advantage of using HLE is that your code only requires a small modification and it will still run on older processors that don't have Intel TSX. What happens here is the instructions that you've marked with the X acquire and the X release prefix don't actually execute the lock isn't acquired at all. Those instructions are initially simply skipped. And the reason for that is if you're using coarse locking, where you, use, where you lock a whole lot of data using a single lock, you often run into a conflict on the lock where someone else has to wait on the lock and they're not actually touching the same data. They might be working somewhere else completely in the structure that we're interested in. If the hardware lock elision mechanism were to do the actual locking, even though it would only do it as part of the transaction, it would mark that cache line in its cache and any other process or thread that tries to acquire the lock would break the transaction. So there would be little benefit if that were the case. What it does instead, it doesn't acquire the lock at all. It simply skips those instructions. It does execute all the instructions that are in between, 
not actually doing the memory write, keeping everything in its cache. And then at the end, if there were no conflicts, it will commit all of the transaction with the exclusion of the lock acquire and the lock release in at once. Basically, do it atomically. If there was a conflict during the execution of the transaction, so there is a transaction abort, all those cache lines are thrown away that were written to during the transaction, so the transaction is gone. And now we re-execute the code, but this time we don't use TSX. This time we execute the entire section of code as though it was running on a processor that didn't have the Intel TSX ex in extension. So now we do take the lock and we do all the writes and the reads in the order required. It's somewhat complicated, but the way it works out is if there is a, con if there is a real conflict, both threads that collide fall back to the old mechanism of taking out the lock and redo the sequence that way. So this way, you only get the performance penalty of the locking in those cases where there is an actual conflict at the expense of a little bit of overhead in the case of an actual conflict. But what you gain is if there is no conflict, which if you're using very coarse locking is likely to be often the case, all the fly code just flies through without having to wait, without having to do any synchronization. Just to show you what this looks like in, 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 in Assembler is on the left here, I've got a simple spin lock code that increments some value in memory. The instructions that are shown in green are where we acquire the lock. The increment instruction in black is whatever we do inside our locked code. And then the red line of code is where we release the lock. So basically there is a value in memory that is zero if the lock is free and it's one if the lock is taken. What we do in the green bit is we basically first set register ECX to a value zero and then we increment it to get a value of one. And then we basically loop where we set register EAX to zero and then we do a compare and exchange. And what the compare and exchange does is it looks at the value in memory we're interested in compares it to the value in EAX, which is zero. So we want to know, is this zero? And if it is zero, then we put our one in it. And then after that, if this was successful, so we have now acquired the lock, then we continue. But if it wasn't, then we jump back and we try it again. This is a spin block that basically the processor is busy until it acquires the lock. So it's a busy wait. After we've acquired the lock, we increment whatever, we do whatever we want to do. Usually there's much more than simply incrementing a single value in one of these. And then we release the lock and then we return to the caller. With hardware lock elision, all we have to do is put an X acquire in front of the instruction where we acquire the lock. And we put an X release in front of the instruction where we release the lock. Any questions so far? All right. There's a second interface into the transactional synchronization extension, and that's called RTM, Restricted Transactional Memory. This is something that uses three completely new instructions. That means that this will only work on a processor that supports TSX. If you run this code on an older processor, you will get an uh, undefined opcode exception. What we do here is we explicitly mark our transaction using an xbegin instruction and an xend instruction at the end. In this case, it works the same as with hardware lock elision. We just go through the code that follows optimistically, just executing it, storing everything we do in these cache lines. But now if there is an abortion of the transaction, we still throw away the transaction, 
But rather than retrying everything without using TSX, we jump to an address that was defined when we, start, when we gave it the xbegin instruction. So the xbegin instruction has an address as an operand. If the transaction needs to be aborted, we jump to that address. So we provide a code path and then we leave it up to the programmer to decide how to handle the abort. For instance, you can, if, if the transaction failed be because someone else was doing something to the same memory, you can decide, okay, I'm going to try it one more time. If it then still fails, then I'm going to do it the old fashioned way, take out a lock, do it, and then release the lock. You can also now force an abort. If you start a transaction and in the middle of the transaction you see something where you're thinking, hmm, this is something I can't handle within this transaction, you can choose to abort the transaction using the X abort instruction. When you get to the alternative code path that you specified where the processor goes if the transaction was aborted, you can read a register to find out the cause of the abortion. This is more work because you need to provide an alternative code path, things like that, but it's a lot more flexible than the hardware lock elision mechanism. Just to have a look at what it looks like, here again on the left side we have the code we started with, on the right side we have our code using RTM. So we begin with an xbegin instruction, then we increment the value in memory, we do whatever work we want to do, and then we have an xend instruction. And as long as there are no collisions, this is all that gets executed. So there's a lot fewer instructions than in the original code. In this case, I've just chosen if we need to go to the xabort code path, which is called retry with spin lock in my example, there we just have the locking code. Now the reason this will work is if we're in this locking code and anyone else tries to touch any of the memory that gets used in the locking code in one of its own transactions, it will break the transaction and it will also send it into this code that tries to acquire the lock. So then it has to wait to acquire the lock. I hope this mechanism is clear too. All right. A few observations. As I've said before, this debuted in uh, Haswell, was then removed by a microcode up uh, update, and then it was reintroduced in later Broadwell steppings and in Skylake. As long as there are no conflicts, locking is almost automatically very fine-grained, because only those memory locations that are actually used within the transaction cause an abortion. That means that if you use like HLE for an, and you use a traditional lock for fallback, you can choose to have a less fine-grained lock as a fallback mechanism because it won't matter that much because it won't get used very often, hopefully. You can nest transactions, so you can have a transaction inside a transaction, but if an abort happens, it aborts all the nested levels of transactions. So you get thrown out to the very outside. I'm not sure if there's any use to nesting abortions. Um, the depth to which you can nest them is probably implementation specific. I haven't read anything about what it's currently at. The granularity at which conflicts are detected is the size of a cache line. So if anything else touches memory within the same cache line we're interested in, that causes an abortion, which means the actual size is implementation specific. Currently in most processors, that would be 64 bytes. There's also an implementation specific limit to the number of cache lines that can be involved in a transaction. The absolute upper limit would be the size of the data cache, obviously. If a transaction doesn't fit inside the data cache, this mechanism can't possibly work. In some cases, there are probably lower limits based on the processor's use of its cache. Uh, there are some 
limited cache line associativity, which means that not every cache line can be used for any memory address. So there are some further restrictions. More observations. If you have a context switch in the middle of your transaction because of an interrupt, for instance, that will typically lead to an abortion. If your transaction size goes up, the risk of an abortion goes up even if there are no conflicts. I tried this with a single threaded application. What you can see here at the bottom is the transaction size. So um, this is a logarithmic scale. So at the very left, you've got one cache line in play. At the very right, you have a thousand cache lines in play. And at the left, you see the number of aborts uh, where the top is pretty much 100% on the code that I run. So you see it go up. And as you near the size of the processor cache, it very quickly goes to 100% there. What this means, even where we're only touching like five cache lines, you already start to see some aborts happening which means that providing a fallback mechanism is essential. You can't just keep repeating this. The other thing I found interesting is there are, you, when, you get, when you get an abort using HLE, you, you're told the reason for the abort through the use of a register. And I found that the uh, different meanings you can find can be an explicit abort, meaning you've used the ex-abort instruction, it can be an actual conflict, which means someone else was touching the same memory. It can be a lack of resources, which probably means you've exceeded the number of cache lines the CPU could use for this mechanism. It could be that you've executed as part of your transaction an instruction that isn't compatible with RTM. There are some instructions, if you use them, it le automatically leads to an abort. And the one I found most interesting is one labeled as an uncommon processor internal event occurred, whatever that may be. <laughs> there is some housekeeping that the processor does internally, and some of that apparently is incompatible with the transaction mechanism. Just to close with a few possible uses for this in VMS, I can imagine us sometime in the future, not in the first release, using this for IO locks on systems that support it. I can see us using it for the scheduling lock. I can see us using this in interlocked queue instructions. If you have any other suggestions where we might use this, let me know. And with that, I'm at the end. Any questions?